Um, I have to say I'm so thrilled that this is the panel I get to be moderating. So again, I'm Jen Hirsch. I'm from EY, that big global advisory and assurance firm. Um, I'm the global technology trend scout there. So my role is to look at how emerging technology, technology ecosystems are changing our day to day, how they impact our business, how they impact our governance, how they impact our government. And what an incredible place to have a cybersecurity discussion. The 2007 cybersecurity attacks in Estonia have set a precedence over increasing and escalating issues that we've seen. And having been at the forefront of kind of solving those challenges, we've only seen them multiply and spread across the world. And every one of my panelists has a really distinct point of view, which I'm so, so happy they get to share today. Um, and Today, we see cybersecurity attacks happen from recycled printers where documents are accessible. We see diplomats in foreign countries being attacked by unnamed and unknown agents. And we also just see that our mobile phone, which I have here today, is increasingly at risk from people hacking it. So what are we to do about it? But with that, I'll turn over a brief introduction so you get a sense of where each of our panelists come from. So Merike? Hi, my name is Merike Keo in Estonian and Skau. So I am a dual citizen. Um, I'm an expat Estonian, and uh, I've started my networking career, or security career rather, building uh, network infrastructures, and that was back in the late 80s, early 90s. As they say, I'm seasoned. And I've been doing network security for well over 20 years. And over the last 20 years, um, it's primarily started off in the technical world and operational world, but in the last 10 years, I've also gone up into more of the policy and governmental aspects. I'm on the Security Advisory Council of ICANN, and currently I'm the CTO of Farsight Security, where um, we're also dealing with threat intelligence, specifically uh, DNS information. Okay, I'm Claire Lane. Uh, as you can see from the information earlier, I work at the NATO CCD COE, which stands for the Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence. Um, I am the Brit, as you can probably tell by my accent. Um, there are 23 different nations there, which is why I say I am the Brit. Um, previous to that, I obviously I worked in the UK. I, my background was technical. Uh, I managed to leave technical after about 15 years of doing um, the real kind of working in the basement, building networks, administrating systems, servers, um, and users. Uh, and then I moved into training, and then I moved into document management, and then I moved into business change. And I've worked across a number of private sectors, such as um, finance, ma manufacturing, food processing, etc. And then I decided that I needed to get government experience as well. So then I've worked in local government and central government. My final posting in the UK before I came out to Tallinn two and a half years ago was in the government in the Ministry of Defence, where I work with defence and the military. Um, Specifically, uh, for the strategy and policy around uh, NATO announced they're adopting cyberspace as a domain of operations. So an awful lot of work on what does that actually mean, how you can use it, when you can use it, and that obviously means full defence um, as well as for any other use. So a very challenging environment and very, very involving and fast-paced. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm, I'm Guy, Guy Goldstein. Uh, I'm a lecturer at the Ecole de Guerre Economique in Paris, the uh, School for Economic Warfare. I'm also a contributor to the Academic Journal of the INSS, the Institute for National Security Studies in Israel. I'm an advisor for PwC in France for matters around cybersecurity and corporate value. I'm a strategic advisor for Expand Capital, which is an uh, investment fund in Luxembourg with matters around cybersecurity. And I'm a fiction writer, uh, which to me is very important with regards to that issue of uh, cybersecurity. Uh, and uh, I, I wrote a, a book uh, 10 years ago, which was somehow about that field, uh, a fiction story about the cyber conflict between China and the US. And that got some traction at, in the US at MIT and also in, in Israel with people actually uh, thinking about that topic for professional reasons. Uh, my name is Ralph Echimendi, and I'm mostly known as the ethical hacker. I've been doing computer hacking since I was 14, and I'm not going to tell you my current age. It's just not worth it. <laughs> um, but uh, I have been mostly on the offensive side of security for most of my life, and uh, over the last 10 years, I've uh, done a lot of uh, on the forensic side of things, so really dealing with incident response. And uh, I guess the most interesting stuff that I've done is I work a lot with Hollywood, 
I've worked on two films with Oliver Stone, Savages and Snowden. I worked on the show Mr. Robot and uh, a couple of other films. Um, so it's been an interesting transition to apply uh, sort of the cybersecurity aspect to, uh, to, to the content, to the arts. Um, and, uh, and that's also given me uh, sort of a, a view into a, a very different world, um, which really is a lot closer to you know, the consumer side of, of, of things when it comes to cybersecurity. So I have a company based here in town in Estonia called Seguru. Uh, we launch in two weeks at an event called Money 2020 in Amsterdam. And my focus is now entirely on empowering everyday people uh, with their mobile devices to be able to know what the hell's going on. So, um, <laughs> so that's, that's it, that's my story. I mean, what an extraordinary panel full of imagination, creativity, practicality, corporates, and, and the business considerations of all of this. So with all of your diverse backgrounds, what's the one thing that keeps you up at night? And I'll start with Mary Kay here and then followed by Guy, and I'm gonna save you for last, Claire. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my biggest worry as I've uh, been watching this, this industry grow in the last two decades is that why are people not doing fundamental hygiene in their devices? Um, as a previous speaker was saying, at this point, it's impacting human life. And so it used to be that, oh, okay, you're not filtering, oh, you're not paying attention in terms of unauthenticated access, well, gee, that's a bummer, you know, bad on you, you know, slap on the wrist. But now it's impacting human life if hospitals are threatened, um, if you're getting uh, malware that's affecting critical life systems. And so when you look at network hygiene, basic network hygiene, it's very simple, right? It's don't, don't use default passwords. Don't, do, uh, don't use unencrypted protocols when you're speaking to devices. Every single startup here in this room should be paying attention to those two fundamental aspects. Because again, if we don't, if we don't do fundamental network hygiene, life can be at risk. Well, so uh, just to build on that, um, uh, so one of the main two things that actually keep me uh, awake at night, among other stuff. Um, <laughs> uh, well, actually, it's, I would say non-threats and non-threats. Non-threats, to go to your point, okay. um, the fact that there is a sort of disconnect between some element of, of awareness that we start to get now. I mean, for the last 10 years, we heard about that threat. And still, there is a disconnect between knowing that something that needs to be done and what do I need to do, actually, either at the individual level, but also at the corporate level. And that perhaps relates to the issue of evaluation of what's the actual cost of that. So that's one thing. And the other thing with regards to unknown threats is actually a lack of imagination that we still see. Uh, and actually, uh, if I talk about issues around cyber defense and so national state stuff, uh, we have been under uh, very successful attacks over the last three, four years. Uh, for example, if I take uh, what happened during the US elections uh, in 2016, except that we were faced with vulnerabilities that we didn't think of because we, uh, some actors, Russia not to name it, uh, attacked our cognitive abilities to think through, say, political issues and so forth. And we never thought, say, of media, for example, as a critical infrastructure. There are other examples. Uh, very recently, we learned that um, a group that was called the Cyber Caliphate that actually attacked uh, a French TV station, uh, um, French TV broadcast TV5 Monde in 2015, also attacked the wives of US soldiers back in early 2015. And here you have another example of some sort of vulnerabilities that we didn't think of when we think about protecting our militaries, and that is the actual families and the actual wives of our soldiers. And what did the attacks look like? So the attacks were basically, you would be receiving SMS, even SMS or emails, or you would have your Twitter, or Twitter feed that all of a sudden would be polluted with big threats like, we're going to get you, we're going to kill you, and so forth, because we are coming from ISIS. Mm. That was coming from cyber caliphate. But actually what we know now, and that's part also an investigation where it's been done in France by ANSI, uh, with regards to TV5 Monde, that cyber caliphate is not ISIS, it's a group from Russia. 
And to some respect, it's part of maybe some dry test that has been attempted in the West with regards to how we can use those, say, open, free social networks to actually impact the cognitive abilities either of the general population or some strategic group of people, individuals, example again, wives of soldiers. And so just an example of, we've never thought of that as critical infrastructure. We never thought of media or social network as critical infrastructure, infrastructure sorry. And maybe it is also. Um, uh, for me, actually, it's uh, something that the previous speaker and, and you mentioned too. I mean, the only thing that uh, really keeps me up at night is, is more related to healthcare and, and how critical systems in healthcare are so easily hackable. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the kind of things that we've seen um, in recent times with healthcare systems have to do because of some sort of malware being put in, in, in these systems or it gets in these systems and it has these effects. But actually, my security career started in healthcare, if you will. I mean, I started doing the hacking thing as a kid at 14 as a hobby, but the, the first time the word security came up was uh, in deploying a medical charting system in the US. And, uh, and one of the big issues there was you're not supposed to be able to modify a medical chart, especially after uh, the person's been discharged. Um, and I could. And so that was the first time that they said, well, mm -hmm. OK, you're the security officer now. I, I thought that was, <laughs> you know, I got gypped because I didn't get the badge and the, and the outfit. But um, <laughs> that was the first time that, that the word came up. And, and, uh, and throughout the years, that's really the, what keeps me up at night. Because at the end of the day, that will affect human lives more so than, I mean, if the power goes out, we're not going to die. But, um, but if, if any one of these systems are modified in any way, unlike the, the, you know, unlike the majority of the things that, that we worry about in, I, in IT security, this is one where integrity is number one um, and, uh, and availability. Um, in other systems, not so much. But on, uh, in healthcare, it really is uh, the one that, that keeps me up at night because at the end of the day, you know, we all have families, friends, and and children to worry about, and if you ever end up in the hospital, uh, the last thing you want to be concerned about is whether any of these values are being modified. And Claire. Okay, <laughs> right. I kind of feel like that was a bit of a drum roll, but I, 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 I'm going to start off by saying I agree with what you said, but I also disagree with you. Um, the reason being um, uh, is that, um, from my perspective, um, I tend to do a lot of work on strategy, which is like really big picture stuff, um, and really big picture stuff actually starts off with every single one of you, um, and it also includes me. Now, I'm going to attempt to stand up here with my, with my battery pack. Hang on. Because um, whilst, I'm, whilst I'm rambling here, can you just hold that so I don't feel out of room? Um, Teamwork. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that don't, I know it's great, isn't it? My glamorous assistant. Uh, well, those of you that may not be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I guess most of you will have a mobile device here. Just Google it uh, if you're not sure what it is. Um, Maslow's Hi hierarchy of needs was written in about 1945 and looks at the motivational um, topics that drive you and me as human beings. Now, as I said, it was written in 1945. And personally, in today's world, I think it needs um, a little bit of an update. So this is Claire's version of the hierarchy of needs, circa 2008. And as you can see, I am totally hack-proof. Um, there is going to be no interruption to my presentation uh, because I've done it old school way. The only thing I need to do is make sure I get it the right way up. So this is what my triangle of needs looks like today. <laughs> because I do not believe that any single one of us, sorry, for those of you that haven't seen it, <laughs> and that side as well, OK? For those of you, you know, we can't do... So, talking about the healthcare, I agree with you, but I also disagree because more important, actually, than healthcare is water. We can only live three days without water, apparently, so Google says. <laughs> but I'm dependent on water provided by a water treatment company. And that water treatment company processes all that water and gets that water to my tap using cyber systems. Now, there was an attack in 2016 on an American water treatment plant where they got in and they altered the chemical levels in that water. And that water was destined for schools, that water was destined for hospitals, and that water was destined to homes. 
So yes, much as I agree with you about healthcare keeping you awake, actually the very fundamentals of this hierarchy of needs actually also gets to me. So even if I look at the other bit, um, and I look at me as a person, I found it really interesting. So we were talking the other day um, about, thank you very much, um, about children. And as we saw, the introduction to this panel was, was done with a very, very young cybersecurity expert. <laughs> I have great hopes for her. Um, and, um, you know, at the age of sort of like six months to 12 months, generally we get a little blankie or we get a favourite toy. And that goes everywhere with us until we're about five. It'll go in the bath with us, it'll go to bed with us, it'll go to school with us, it'll go to the playground with us and everything else. And then do you know what? At the age of seven, we get one of these things called a mobile device. And that's our blankie until the day we die. It goes everywhere with us. It goes to the bathroom with us. It goes to the mm -hmm. office with us. It goes to the sports club with us. It does everything with us. And in London, I didn't need to take my purse out of the house with me because I had Apple Pay, so I could buy my lunch and I could buy my water, so I could take care of my needs. Here in Estonia, I found somewhere to live online. I signed all my legal documents with regards to that, at least through the e-signature, totally dependent on e. So even meeting these very, very basic needs today is all done through cyber. And this was great. So I was in Helsinki a couple of weeks ago at another seminar, and we were talking about crisis response and how to do this when the lights go out and there's no power. And they said, you don't worry about it. It's fine. We have a crisis response system. I said, great, what do you do? They said, the first thing we do is we ring somebody. OK. Is that a landline, per chance? Hmm. Is that an analog line, per chance? Oh, no, it's a mobile. <laughs> so there's no power and there's no cell tower. <laughs> what are you going to do? We're all dependent on it, and it goes through every single level of our society. So my concern is actually society, because the whole of society, every single thing we do today, even if you don't personally do it, every time you flick that light switch, you're dependent on cyber. Every time you get a glass of water, you're dependent on cyber. Every time you want your bins emptied, I bet you do all that online. Everything is reliant on cyber. And yet, there isn't a single system, I believe, that is secure. So everything we do today is at risk. And that, for me, is why cybersecurity uh, is so important. So as individuals, we're increasingly responsible. But yet, we're also increasingly vulnerable because every one of us is an agent with our digital devices. Yeah. And every one of us is unaware of the multitude of, of dependencies that we have on a cybersecurity infrastructure. And, and so, what, what can we do? What is one takeaway every one of us can do at each of your expertise to better equip ourselves for the future, the vulnerable future we're living in? So from my perspective, every single one of us, that means everybody here in the room, all of us panelists, need to be absolutely aware of what we're doing in the electronic world mm. that can potentially be misused by somebody because if you have a Fitbit, I don't have one. If you're doing email on your phone that is part of you know, the corporate um, environment, you have your personal phone, but you're, you're also allowed to do corporate email on there and you have sensitive information on there, where are you backing it up? On the cloud? You know, the cloud is somebody else's computer, right? It's just not yours. It's not just some mythical thing out there in space. It's some computer that you're trusting somebody else to run effectively and not to be hackable. So really looking at what are the electronics that you're using in your home, what's internet connected, what kind of information is being sent. Now, I have to tell you, I bought a television, I tell the story all the time because it makes people laugh, but I am a geek. I bought a television now a year ago, my criteria was that it does IPv6. For those of you that don't know what that is, it's the next generation internet, and I just, I wanted to play. But that's all I wanted. When it was installed in my house, the installer said, okay, what's your Wi-Fi password? I'm like, okay, you're done, I'll take over. And then <laughs> I started looking at, oh, I never even thought about this. It's, a, uh, it's an Android device. I'm like, huh. And so I started looking at all the screens, you know, the configuration screens on my television, to see, well, what is it set up for? And you know, it was set up for, by default to send certain information to some place. I don't know what that is. Now, because I'm a techie, I actually went and, you know, I, I, I looked on the network, I was able to see what is it trying to send, I can maybe figure it out. And 
you know, it, it was even too difficult. I didn't have the time. I was like, forget it. I'm just turned everything off. And then I installed it on my Wi-Fi, right? But we don't even know these Fitbit devices or televisions, the things that you talk to at home that do things automatically, um, right? What else are they doing? What information are they gathering about us? And if you're developing these kinds of devices, right, I will ask you to think really carefully about what information needs to be turned on by default because the normal consumer is not me, right, who's going to sit there and try and figure out the, what the device is doing. They're going to, just going to utilize it. And so with the onset of, I will say the acronym, sorry, GDPR, but because of that, at least here in Europe, you're going to have to pay much more attention, I'm certain you have, in terms of what information you will gather, what you will send out. But I do wish that everybody paid attention to this because every one of us has a role to play in internet safety. Shall I, I'll dip in just quickly. Um, following on from that, I would take it one step further, which is something that I tend to add into the mix of this is what I call resilience. So because I lead on from that there's no such thing as an unhackable system or something that is 100% protected, what, are, what am I going to do when I can't do it? So what am I going to do when my phone... I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only person here in, 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 the, in, the, in the room today who has had the experience of putting their phone through the washing machine. Please don't tell me I'm the only person that's done that. Or dropped it down the toilet, or had your kids drop it down the toilet, or do something with it. That's and then I suddenly think, I can't function without it. All the data that's on it, so all my names and addresses, all those emails, um, all my flight tickets and my holidays, you know, all the really important stuff is all there. Um, and uh, I know it sounds really crazy, but how often do I back it up? Actually, you know, I'm sitting up here as some kind of expert, and I would be embarrassed if I actually had to say out loud how often I actually did or didn't back it up. But it is, it is also how are we going to, how are we going to um, be resilient against it because attacks will happen. Mm -hmm. So how can we cope without such technology? How can we continue when we have a degraded environment? How do we get by when um, there isn't the availability? Because that's also really important as well. We should be able to manage. We should be able to leave home and forget our phone and leave it on the kitchen counter for a day and the world not actually fall apart. Um, and again, I'm not quite sure that we remember how to do that. I am astounded how many people don't realise that their phones have an off button. Not just a flight <laughs> safe mode, but an actual off button. Um, and, and just some of the really simple things about being able to cope without. Uh, and, and what do you do to be resilient and how are you going to manage? So again, with businesses, uh, it, is, it is if you lose your data, how are you going to recover that? How do you get it back? How do you restore it? How do you, how do you continue with your business? and not suffer some kind of loss, whether that's reputational, whether that's financial, how do you actually manage to do that? Um, yeah, go, Claire, go I saw on. such a great slogan the other day on a t-shirt that said, offline is the new black. You all hear that? Offline yeah. is the yeah. new black. But you know, I actually have a real case story. Um, I went on a cruise a year ago and something happened to the network and it was a cruise of, I don't know, it was the huge cruise ship, 5,000 people. They had to go back to the paper and pen manifesto and you know mm -hmm. onboarding yeah. took about five hours longer yeah but there was something wrong with the network now I was trying to find out what it was so I could help fix it but <laughs> they wouldn't let me you know? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah good security yeah yes. but, but seriously yeah. I mean these things happen yep. and do you then have a backup that you can go to very quickly right, to get the business done. Yeah. So it's a very it good point. Business. And, and that's what we're talking about here, you know, all the startups, all the businesses, because any of this will affect the bottom line because it does cost, as we'll move on to later. But there is a cost. It's not just some little incident that you can, that you can gloss over. So I would like to see more business actually practicing, actually practicing their business continuity and their resilience and not just saying, yeah, 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 I've got it covered. But that's an important question, right? What is the cost to businesses? And both of you have businesses in the space and have advised a lot of it. Um, and, and businesses are a collection of individuals who are made up with each individual agency, each individual vulnerability. So A, what's the cost to business? And B, what's the framework that they need to think about? Um, you know, as a 250,000 person company representative, it's huge. And any one of us could be vulnerable. Well, so just to... to uh, to touch on the subject of how much is at stake in terms of value for a, any corporation. So that's a, 
a small study that the uh, preliminary study that I ran with PwC in France, and there'll be some uh, further research going this year. But what we, we came up with, uh, looking at about 30 major incidents uh, over the last uh, 10 years for major companies, actually, publicly listed, because there we could see the impact on the actual value of a company, on the stock price, of a short term, but also of a long term, 12 months. That's about you know, a good range to see if indeed there are structural impacts from a cyber incident. And so realized that basically you're know, out of this small sample, again, you're very preliminary, but we had about one third of the companies that, were, that managed to go through the data leak without any issue, but then two thirds that were materially impacted by uh, those incidents. Um, Small segments, about a quarter, uh, actually first got the hit, which translated into, say, a 7% stock price reduction in the first week you know, after the incident, and then went further. But after the first two months, you could see some sort of rebound. And thus, that was the realization that some of those, a quarter of those companies could be resilient. And there are some elements into that why they were resilient. But then another 40% of those companies actually really took a big shock. And after 12 months, you could see that they were about 20% stock price below the stock price that they have before the incident. The interesting thing here is when you relate that to much older studies, which had been done 15 years ago with regards to reputational risk, because this is really what's at stake here, the ability to continue to deliver good value to your client and then not to have your competitor steal your business because you're not able to deliver that value. And so looking back at older studies, there was about the same figures. That is, companies that are not resilient, that take the, the, the shock, they are going to lose about 50% stock price reduction over 12 months. So comparable to the 20% figures. And another interesting fact, the one which were good at crisis management, so the so-called resilient companies, in the older studies, they would end up at 7% stock price above the stock price at the moment of announcement of incident. And in our new cyber study, it was exactly the same figure. So that does show that when you show up resiliency and that you've shown that you were able to cope uh, with, that, uh, with the right crisis management tools and procedures and people, then actually you're able to show to the market that you can absorb the shock and somehow you get out a bit stronger than before the crisis. But still, again, 40% did have that 20% stock price down, and that's definitely some sort of board event uh, with very frequently a situation where we, you need to actually ever fire the CTO or even fire the CEO. What about that? Um, well, I mean, I can tell you personally, on average, uh, the kind of cases that I've had to deal with were in the millions of dollars. Because it's not, once a breach has taken place, that's not really a tech problem, that's a legal problem. Um, and, uh, and it gets expensive, obviously, because uh, now everything has to follow a, a legal process. So uh, you take something like the Sony breach as an example, you know, when, when Sony Entertainment got hacked. Um, and at the time, you know, I go between Talon and LA, so, uh, it, it was crazy uh, in the sense that an entire company of that size was completely crippled. And I mean to the point where uh, their employees got calls uh, that basically said, we don't know if it's safe for you to use your cell phone, your personal cell phone. So in a case like that, I think, and of course they, no, no real numbers were ever reported about that, but I think we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars was the cost of that Sony breach. Um, and then we get into, you know, uh, you know attribution from, from a lot of these different type of, of, of more political type of, of issues uh, becomes a very gray area. So it's not just the pure dollar or, you know, cost in, in the sense of, of money. There's a much greater impact than just the, the cost of, of, you know, the, the pure financial uh, implications of these, these type of hacks. And, and the, real, the real issue here is that impact is based on time when it comes to these issues. So the crazy part is that the average is somewhere 
above 200 days before you know you've been hacked. And this goes back to some of the things you were saying, which is, what, you didn't notice that terabytes are going to a new IP address somewhere? Mm -hmm. How do you miss this? Um, and you've got to re also realize that encryption is actually now being used against us. So, uh, in other words, these are all encrypted communications so that we can't see what the data is. Um, but you can just tell that I've never talked to, those, to that IP before, and so all of a sudden you see com communications taking place. Why is it that it takes most organizations over 200 days to figure that out? With that much time, they've already taken everything they need to take. Um, and uh, the damage is, is far, you know, far greater than you can possibly imagine. You probably won't even see the damage for some months thereafter. So. Yeah, I'd like to emphasize something that Claire was saying, which is extremely important, which is crisis management. Right? You need to have an incident response plan. And uh, I can't even uh, stress important enough. I mean, I can't place enough importance on you guys should all have this. I don't care who you work for, I don't care what you do, you should understand that if somebody has a breach in your environment or you got hacked, right, what do you do in terms of how do you mitigate the issue, who communicates to whom, and also what are you legally liable for? Mm -hmm. And having those plans in place before something happens will save you on your reputation and on a lot of other mm -hmm. costs. To, to that point, one of, the, you know, one of the exercises that I think I had the most fun putting together and doing was to actually create a mock incident mm -hmm. and test, actually test this, test this mm -hmm. company's incident response plan by creating, it, creating an incident. Look, I just pulled this down off the deep web. It says that this database was hacked. Mm -hmm. Who's going to do what now? And just watch all the different departments go, what? Okay, so who's going to take from here? Okay, legal, human resources? And how what do corporations, happens? though, balance the cost of putting something like that together, taking their employees and teams time away from the day-to-day -day versus an unknown quantity in the future? What are some frameworks that these companies can use to kind of justify we need to do this today and not as a response to a Sony-level hack? Well, again, to the point where you just said, the importance of testing and simulating which is really the right way to actually check the incident response plan that you're, you talked about. Uh, that's where you're actually going to play out, and if you do those things properly, you could even think of the impact, say, on your clients, and then start to actually put a figure number as to what may be the actual cost on your reputation, the legal, and also the technical aspect. So again, the issue of simulation and simulating whatever the risk that you're facing to is absolutely critical. That's really how life you know, starts. That's really how you start understanding all those different components, which is part of cybersecurity, the technical, the procedure, the people aspects, the cultural aspect, the commercial aspect, because we're dealing with a very you know, wide and complex system for the very reason that you mentioned initially that was talked about here, that cyber and digital is everywhere. I think one of the things that I find quite interesting is that more years ago than I like to admit now, uh, I used to work in London in a finance company, and it was at the time when the IRA were busy blowing London up. Um, and I'm probably one of the few civilians, and um, IT civilians, that has actually been um, blown up. So the office that I was working in, I was upgrading the servers on the day. I was in the basement, thankfully, um, and everything went off. The halogen went off, the alarms went off, everything went off, and I came out and thought, God, it looked like a bomb's gone off, and it had. What I found quite interesting was, as a result of that, the company I worked for set up a ghost room, so we had, an, uh, we had another office and we had all the backup links and we had duplicate comms links and we had duplicate feeds from Bloomberg's and all the Reuters and trading systems and all the And every single week, me and my colleague would rush down to the basement at some random time and flick all the switches that turned everything upstairs off and everything in the field on. Every single week we exercised mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. response, this crisis. I struggle today to find any company anywhere that ever exercises their crisis response properly, realistically. I know, I know most um, organizations and most buildings will test the fire alarm once a year, but I don't know of any that actually test the loss of comms links, the loss of the server room, the loss of the building utterly and completely, and how they would cope with it. 
I, I have, uh, if there's anybody out there, do come and talk to me afterwards because I would love mm -hmm. to talk to you. But I don't know of anybody anywhere that actually does proper simulation, testing, recovery and resilience. A lot of people talk about it, but I've never seen it. And, and there are industries where it's done. For airline industry, airline when you industry, mentioned that. Yeah. And, and it's costly. I mean, for any pilots, for example, it's going to be 10 days yeah. of uh, very sophisticated simulators. It's quite a cost for the company. And chemicals. But it's chemicals required yeah. in chemical industry. Chemical so. industry Absolutely. do chemical incident recovery, but I don't know of the cyber world. Uh, I don't. I, I don't think that you can actually test for every single case. No, not every case. And you know, one of the things that's become very clear to me is that the cyber world just mimics the physical world. Mm. So I was actually here in 2007 in May when all the attacks happened, and what the Estonians said, and I had this aha moment. You're absolutely right. They said, you know, we had physical riots, mm. and then we had riots in cyberspace. Right? And so when people think that somehow in the virtual space, we have to be perfect in terms of security. Um, I was asked a couple of weeks ago, so what is your opinion? How do you think we can stop spam? Hmm. And I just looked at him and I said, let me turn that around. How do you think we can stop physical crime? Right? And so you can never have 100% security. But what you need to figure out is what is the risk in your environment and if you're a business, I always think about what is your business risk tolerance? Mm -hmm. So you do have to think about it as a mental exercise. And then where you may have the biggest risk financially or through some other you know, criteria that is important to you, then do those types of tabletop mm -hmm. exercises. Mm -hmm. And I know many companies that do do them. And actually what I found really fascinating was Estonia had the EU presidency right, just recently. They actually had a tabletop exercise uh, to deal with uh, 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 cyber crises, and they had the ministers involved, right? And the ministers first, I, I hear this, okay, I wasn't there personally, but at first they're like, why would we shoot, why, what are we gonna do? This is a technical problem, right? Yet after the exercise, what they realized that, oh, we have a role to play, right? And everybody has a role to play. It doesn't matter what position you have, in the government, in the digital society ecosystem, all of us have to figure out if there's a crisis, what do we do, what is your role, and hopefully you will have plans in place a priori before the crisis happens so that you can deal with it. And that goes again to the issue of simulating um, uh, team management. Again, mm -hmm. if I take the example of airlines uh, simulation, it mostly started with, uh, with understanding that whatever happens in the cockpit, you know, it's with the pilot, the co-pilot, the mechanicians, some of the guys you know, in, in, the, in the crew management, in the team, and that had to be simulated also. Same in medical simulation. Understand you have a surgical operation, then you have the main surgeon, the nurses, all the other specialists. That needs to be simulated, and that's done now in medical school. And, and again, cyber is a, a team story. Hey, to, like, to, to err is human, yeah. to blame mm -hmm. it on a computer is even more so. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, Somebody else's fault. Yeah. Yeah. Some things. We, fault. Keep, we keep thinking that the problem is the computer and right. the problem is the people. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, that's, that's the real issue and, uh, and, and we're not fully addressing it because there's so much that is just neither not understood at all or mm -hmm. misunderstood. Mm -hmm. So I think that that leads to another question. With all the threats and challenges we've enumerated today, this is a great area for startups to come in. There's a lot of challenges to be solved that we don't yet have computers to blame for, or teams of people that we can rely on. Um, if each of you was to take one challenge that you'd like for a startup to solve, what would that be? And maybe let's start with you and Suguru and kind of where you see maybe a well, preview that, if you can. That's exactly what the challenge was, was uh, well, how do I, you know, I, I, I tried to basically simplify this and, uh, and basically gave it to my mother and say, can you tell me what this is? And if my mother couldn't tell me in a minute, then I wasn't doing my job in digesting and making this digestible to, to everyone. Mom's um, is the lowest common denominator. Mom is the, yeah, <laughs> okay. is the bar that we go by. So, um, so the, you know, and it, and it is a, a big undertaking to basically take something as complex as what's, and, and going back to some of the things, I didn't know that my phone was talking to Russia and China. So, and I should, right? So when we first started this project and started looking at what communications were taking place, we found things that we were unaware of, right? 
Um, so to put it in very basic, very understandable, digestible terms, think of it as you're traveling. In the physical world, when you travel, you kind of know where you're going. Well, you're traveling right now in your seats <laughs> all over the world. Mm. You just don't actually know where you're traveling. <laughs> uh, so let's start with that and, and put that in a, in, a, in a visual way that everyone can understand as a map. We all understand GPS, so we GPS your, your, you know, your, your data, okay? And, um, you know, in, in Hollywood, they say that content is king. And, uh, I, you know, to add to that is data is the kingdom now mm. uh, because everything is data. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, let's start with awareness. Let's start by ed educating the consumer. And, and I think, you know, I don't want to say that there's, it's not that there's no corporation or government. It's just that what do you think those people? Those are people, consumers, too, who work in these places. So, you know, we're, there's consumers and creators, and, you know, we happen to be on, on both of those, right? Mm -hmm. But there is much, many, many more consumers mm -hmm. than there are creators. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just need to make it digestible. You know, these issues are, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that by saying I think it's really about safety. And I know that that word, you use that word, and, but the thing is the word security, uh, to most people, psychologically, you think of that guy standing at the door mm -hmm. with, the, with, with the shirt that says security, and nobody really wants to deal with that guy. If you can go around it, you know, Because he'll that's always what, say no. Yeah. No, he'll, he's, he's going to say something. Yeah. It's going to make it harder mm -hmm. to get yeah. in. Yeah. Um, but when you think of the word safety, yeah. you know, uh, you think about it like with, with, with what NASA did after they had, you know, some incidents, is they made safety part of the mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the issue, is we have to make... This issue of security, I kind of like to try to stay away from using the word security nowadays and try to use more of, of, of you know, of, of safety because we're all responsible to each other, uh, I think, at the end of the day. And, um, you know, figuring out how to, how to actually communicate this to, so that everyone can understand it. And more importantly, as you were saying, care mm -hmm. because they generally don't care because they see that, yeah. oh, it's that, it's that security yeah. thing again. I don't really want to deal with that. So It's just okay. So one challenge, Key. Sorry? One challenge for a startup. Uh, one challenge? Well, yeah. uh, in terms of field, that we go to, you know, I'll just continue what we've been discussing. Simulation, simulation, simulation. At the individual level, at the corporate level, at the city level, at the nation state level. I think there's a whole field here that needs to be taken. Claire? Mm. I think I'm, I'm just going to give everybody a copy okay. of this. Because <laughs> it's, it's everybody's business and it's everywhere. And I, I mean, I, I like the idea of making it translatable because I think, I think a lot of it is to do with, um, never mind mother, if grandmother can understand it nowadays, yeah, exactly. then, then we're doing it right. So if the grandmother can understand it and the six-year-old is better at, at programming my tech than I am, then we're probably making progress. Yeah. But I think it is making it accessible, making it accessible to everybody so that, so that everybody can, can take part in it. Right. I think that everybody here, especially in the startup land, when you're dealing with electronic communication, you want to pay attention who has access to your device. You want to uh, uh, make sure that you understand how the access is provided so via protocols. In tech terms, it's cryptographic protection, but you want to have uh, integrity because you want to make sure that whoever's connecting to it is somebody who you think they are. And then lastly, also, you want to be careful about what information gets passed back and forth and pay attention that it's really the critical information you need to have that's on by default because that information goes around the world everywhere and people have access to it that shouldn't and can maybe abuse, abuse, um, abuse the, I, don't know, I don't even know how to say it, but create abusive environments because of information and data that, have, that they have access to. They want to do something malicious. So let's each of us take a bit more personal responsibility and oversight, um, work with one another, because we'll never have the whole picture, and kind of do away with the stigma of I got something wrong, because that's usually where things really go off rails is when we don't call attention to it, we let something lapse that we think may be an error. So I want to thank my panelists. Thank you so much, and let it open to questions. So thank you. Thank you for having me. So thank you very much, everybody. Do we have any questions in the crowd here? Oh, nice and easy. Uh, how can we keep our phones safe? 
Um, <laughs> Turn it off. <laughs> well, like I, like I was saying, it starts with, with knowing what your phone is doing. Um, you know, mm. automation uh, can be used against you. So it's not to say that we can just create a product that goes, here, you're automatically safe. Uh, because then, as a hacker, I would use that to, to, to basically make your, your phone not usable. So part of it is to sort of learn what you do, not us learn what you do, you learn what you do uh, and what you want it to do. Um, so it's, it's a matter of shedding light on, on where your traffic is going for the most part. And then once you know that, then you can say, well, I, I, I don't want that to happen. I can block that. So to give you the, to give you the control to do that um, is, is the key. Uh, but then to make it, I, I kind of use the word gamify it a bit because you have to make it digestible and fun. Like I said, most people, unfortunately, security is sold through fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Um, and uh, that, those things don't work out very well for, 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 you know, for everyday people. So um, really what you can do is just be more aware of what your phone is doing. Right now, unfortunately, you don't even know. Uh, just like I didn't know when we started this project. So um, that's what you can do. There's another question over there. Let's see what I yeah. to that. Or I would add to that that if you're dealing with applications, right, try and actually read what the application is allowed to do and what you're giving permission mm. to do when you're just saying, yes, download it. Mm. Because you might be giving the application permission to look at all of your data on the phone, even things that it has no business to have access to. There's applications that, that ask you for microphone access that have nothing to do with your microphone. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, and we say, okay. Yeah, okay, yep. okay. Mm -hmm. pay, pay attention. How can we keep our children safe? Can we actually start teaching them about the cybersecurity early on? Could that change our mindset in the future or the, in the future of our children? Absolutely, and in fact, that's a, a really important uh, issue and question. Um, you know, at, at what age should a child actually have this kind of unfettered access to everything. Because that's, you know, going back to what you said, the internet is just a reflection of human beings. Forget the technological part of it. The good, the bad, and the ugly is all there. And a child can find that pretty easily. Um, so, yes, the more, the more and the earlier that we kind of educate them about it, you know. Uh, something that, that us hackers love to do with our kids early on is teach them how to pick a lock. <laughs> because that makes them start thinking through the process of how a system works mm. uh, and, and starts kind of instilling that mindset of systematically looking at an issue. And, and uh, it's great, not to mention when the door gets locked, they know how to get around. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, we, we all know that you teach little kids sometimes don't talk to strangers. Right. And I think at that time, as you're starting to to teach kids that you should also start teaching them about, you know, don't tell don't tell somebody, you know, the, the password or whatever, however you want to say it. Like, this is a secret. It's just a secret. It's your secret. I shouldn't even know it as your mom. Right. Well, I mean, to your point, yeah. why is it that and this is the disconnect with with psychologically with cyber versus physical. If you, we teach our kids not to talk to strangers, but that's not the same case on, online. Mm. Right. And, and also as well, physically, if a child is going somewhere, generally you say, where are you going? Mm. Yeah. And what time will you be back? And we don't do that when yeah. we're online either. Fact, and who will you, will you be and with? And who, who are you going with? Yeah. yeah. So, so I, I think there is, there is an awareness, I think helping them understand early on the data that they're, what, what is data, and therefore yeah. when they're yeah. saying things and doing things, um, Having, having more of an awareness. But then that, that kind of intimates that, as an adult, I understand it. Right. And some of the difficulty is, is that as an adult, like you were saying, I don't even know. Right. So some of it is more difficult, but the basics about not having default passwords, not having the pet cat name right. as the kid's password, <laughs> right. you know, and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, oh, which reminds me, it, yeah. I cannot believe how many people on their phones take these silly quizzes where they give away all of the information mm. that somebody can piece together in terms of, you know, who was your first boyfriend, what was your, you know, your mother's maiden name, and all that other mm. stuff, that really it's collecting information about you where they can potentially steal your identity somewhere. Mm. Don't do those quizzes. <laughs> I got to tell my mom. Mm. 
Which, moms are vulnerable. <laughs> so we, we, we have time for one last oh. question. Excellent. So you mentioned that every digital system can be hacked or can go offline, and then it would be nice to have some analog or on offline version that works. But at the same time, this dig digital innovation is killing the analog systems. So how do we cope with this, this contradiction? I think um, there, are, there are areas where um, the recognition of the fact that we need old skill sets exist. So in the UK, for example, um, emergency services uh, in London still learn how to use the A to Z, which for those that you don't know is the, the, the kind of hard copy uh, Google Maps. So they, so they still know how to read maps. So that if they get an emergency call and GPS isn't working, they, ac they can still actually reach, reach that, um, that address. The armed forces in many nations still learn to map read. Uh, in Russia, um, a lot of the troops are learned how to use typewriters. So there is recognition. I mean, and I, I actually remembered how to use flip chart and pen. <laughs> so, you know, it is actually possible. But again, I think for the next generation, it's more of a challenge mm -hmm. because they don't know how to do it and we're not teaching them. We don't teach them how to read maps. We don't teach them how to use pen and paper anymore. They draw everything on their iPads or on, on tablets. The other makes are available. Um, you, you know, so, so I think the generation that we are, we've actually got a far greater responsibility to the next generation to make sure that those skill sets are not less. Because we're fortunate we have those skills. It's the next generation that I worry about because they don't. And we are responsible for passing that on. And one last point um, with regards to making everything digital. We do that because there's a use case here. We take better decisions. We do that quicker. But in some activities, you actually don't need that much. So I give just one example, which is a big one, but which is, for example, the use of nuclear forces. Uh, in the US, there's been a, a big debate about how much we need to go digital with regards to, say, all those uh, silos that you see in the movies where you could actually send missiles to the other side. And, you know, they decided so far that uh, they may not need to have so much digitalization in those systems, because basically when you're faced with, say, nuclear crisis with, uh, with Russia, you may need actually to tamper things a little bit, not to be too quick, not to rush to a decision. So it's not a bad thing to have still all systems where there's a little, very small community of, uh, of, uh, of developers that know those little things and not a large pool of guys where you'd find hackers. But just to tell you that and as much as we need digitalization, we need innovation because the use case is clear, is there, is to take the better decisions quicker, in some areas, you, know, you can accept that you don't need that much digitalization. Thank you. So thank you so much, Startup Estonia's Future of Cybersecurity Panel.